Amen. Well, a special uh, welcome again to those who are um, uh, friends of Faye and Tenny. It's great to have you here, and we are thrilled to be able to join, uh, to have you joining with us. Um, this is the last of our series on the resurrection. Um, we've had a series for the last six weeks called Alive since Easter, and we've been looking at different aspects of the resurrection and why it's important. The resurrection is the event that divides history between BC and AD. It's because of Jesus rising from the dead that we are Christians at all. Because he has risen from the dead, he's alive, and we can know him personally. That's why it's so important. And because we can know him personally, he changes us, he can transform us because of the power that is given to us that can actually change us to be more and more like him, more and more like the people we were created by God to be. All the things that hold us back in our lives, all the things which kind of get in the way, all the things where, um, that drag us down, that we feel actually these are difficult things, actually find a meaning, but also find a way forwards in Christ. Um, what I want to do today is to look at three things that are going to that help us to understand why the resurrection is important, and it's applicable to each one of us. And we get it from this passage today. And this passage in Romans, I'm, I'm always kind of nervous about um, preaching in Romans because there's, there's so much depth, there's so much there, and I want to try and do it justice. And really, I have to be honest, I'm just going to scrape the surface of this, but it is so amazing. And it's amazing this, um, this reading fell on the same day that Dara was being baptized. That wasn't planned, but it is amazing because this passage really brings to life what baptism is all about and what has happened with Dara. So the first thing I want to say which, that the resurrection brings to life is um, a new beginning for us, a new beginning. Look at verse 3 of Romans chapter 6. Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? So what was going on when Dara was being baptized? What's baptism all about? Well, baptism comes from the word baptizo, Greek word baptizo, which um, means to be overwhelmed. If you imagine a ship that's riding on top of the water, and um, it's, uh, I love sailing, and I love it when I'm sailing on top of the water, uh, but there are occasions when the wind just gets the better of you, and the, the sail goes over, the boat goes over, and you begin to... Um, uh, start kind of going down in the water. Now, boats, uh, dinghies are designed to stay afloat. They have extra buoyancy and so on. But actually, sometimes the buoyancy doesn't work. And if you're in real trouble and you've got a boat that doesn't really work very well, you keep going down. And um, if you don't right it again quickly, you will keep on going down and down and down until it sinks. And the word baptizo is about not just floating on top of the water. It's a, a picture of a boat that's been submerged in the water. It's completely overwhelmed. It's completely covered inside and out in water. If you're a sailor, it's a nightmare. But if you're being baptized, it's wonderful <laughs> because it's about being overwhelmed. It's being completely surrounded, completely encapsulated, completely overwhelmed, fully submerged in that water. And the picture is of death. We are going with Jesus down into his death. When we are baptized, we are baptized into Jesus' death. Paul uses this word in Christ a lot, being in Christ. What he means by that is that everything, when we're a Christian, when we have given our hearts to Christ, we are in him. It's a bit like um, this Bible. If this is Christ and you're this booklet, you're in Christ. So everything that happens to Christ happens to you. So just as Jesus died, when we give our lives to Christ, we die. It's like the old self, the self that is, and we'll look at this in a minute, that is consumed by sin, that is kind of dragged down, that's kind of um, off track, dies. The old self dies. And when Jesus was risen from the dead, because we're in Christ, we in ourselves, we are raised with Christ as well. We have a new self. Look at verse 4 of Romans 6. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. So Dara's baptism reminds us of our own baptism that every one of us who have become Christians have 
um, experience this baptism. If you've never been baptized as a Christian, let me encourage you, you must get baptized. It's the, it's the entry point into the Christian faith. It's a symbol, not just to you, but to the whole world, that something has happened, that something old has died and something new has started living in you, that you've given your life, you're under new marching orders, that you belong to the king of kings and not to the, um, to the world and to the devil. So what's happened to this old life? Well, the things that we've done wrong in our lives, the things where we've, uh, we're kind of orientated in the wrong direction, the regrets that we have, the, um, the, the sins that, might, that we might have got caught up in, those are gone. The old life, they've been dead and buried with the old life. We can be free of those things. We can be forgiven from things, no matter how great. Perhaps we've made decisions in our lives that we regret. The reality is those decisions, the, 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 respond, you know, the realities following those decisions will, will happen, will, will be in place. But actually, what has tangled us in, up in them, the things which have bound us to those decisions, we can be free from because that's part of the old self that's died and we have a new self. Those things are in the past. And there is the promise of something new. The old has gone. And look at verse 5. If we've been united with him, as Jesus, in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. There is a new life that we have as Christians. There is a new start that, we've, uh, that we're given. That's the most extraordinary thing. I kind of want some water. Um, Andrew, do you mind giving me some water, please? Is that right? Um, I'm going to drink a little bit of it, but I'm going to do something else with it. Cause I'd, oh, that's great. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. This water, fantastic to drink, but it's actually about <laughs> baptism. This is about the water. I want everyone to experience this because this is the water that cleanses and changes us. You weren't expecting that, were you? <laughs> yeah, you think you haven't got it at the back. I've, I'm coming. <laughs> It's like it's not too bad, hopefully. Perhaps this is what it's about. You get kind of watered by um, the Lord, <laughs> both inside, but outside. That's the kind of outside image. But actually, this is a symbol. Thank you, Andrew. Um, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Andrew. Yeah. Um, <laughs> this is the symbol of what's happened. The old has gone. It's been washed away. We've been washed in the deep waters of baptism. We have a new life. Something new, a new start, a new beginning. Just as you've kind of felt that spray, that kind of, um, it was only a spray. You're lucky I didn't get a bucket. <laughs> but actually, as that begins to, as, just as you feel it on your skin, the new beginning, that's possible because of what Jesus has done on the cross. On the cross, the power of sin, the power of death, the power of those things that drag us down, that hold us back from the life that God intended us to lead, the power of all those things is broken. And when Jesus was raised from the dead, the power that raised Jesus from the dead, that gave him new life, is the same power that's at work in you and me. That power is at work to give us new life, to give us a new start, to give us a new beginning. That changes everything. The resurrection breaks the power of death so that we can experience new life. What does that mean in practice? There are some things in our lives that we look back at and we just think, I wish that had never happened. There are some decisions that we've made. There are some things that we've said. There are some things that we've done. And they keep on haunting us. The resurrection is the evidence and the power that says that doesn't need to be like that anymore. You can make a new start. Second thing we see here that brings the resurrection to life for us is that we are given a new freedom. You know, a new freedom. Sin is more powerful than we think it is. I think the problem with us human beings is that we kind of dabble in sin. We dabble in it. We know that it's 
not right when we sin, when we do things wrong. And, you know, as long as, you know, I'm not murdering someone, but I'm just kind of doing something I, I know is not quite right. Or I just keep on, you know, my conscience is kind of awakened. And I think, oh, but actually I keep on doing it. It might be anything from self-pity to gossiping to a lust for money or sex or power, those classic things for leaders. It might be a white lie. I was thinking about white lies. It's a bizarre thing to call something which is a, a sin. A white lie. I mean, does that mean that it's just a slightly different colored black lie? Um, I mean, a lie is a lie, even though we call it a white lie. We think it's actually a good kind of lie, but it's still a lie. The reality is that sin is powerful and it grips us. It doesn't matter if it's a small amount of sin or a big amount of sin, it is still a sin. It still distorts our relationship with God, with our relationship with other people, our relationship with our community, our relationship with ourselves. Paul here, writing Romans, this letter to the Romans, says it's actually like being a slave. It's like being a slave to sin. Look at verse 6. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Ruled by sin, slaves to sin. This is actually the reality. When we try to detach ourselves from these things, we realize actually that it's a bit more difficult than we thought. It's like, um, I was, we had a chain here. We used to have a chain somewhere. I used it for a talk a few weeks ago. But imagine my legs being chained and um, me being padlocked to those chains so that actually I can't get loose. I can say, okay, well, you know, I'm just slightly kind of, um, whatever it is, you know, I, I'm really wanting to have um, what my neighbor's got, say. You know, I'm just wanting it, wanting it, wanting it. And someone says, you know, you shouldn't do that. I say, yeah, I know I shouldn't. But I just kind of like, you know, just fantasizing my mind about it. And then as soon as I try and not do that, actually I find myself plagued by it. I can't get through. And it's, being like, it's like trying to get loose from this thing that's binding me. We are slaves. It's like we're bound with a chain. I just want to ask the question, how is it possible for Christians to be enslaved in sin? You know, the reality as Christians is that we died to that. That's what Paul's saying here. We died to these things, these sins, when we became Christians. So the reality is we're living in a new life. We're living in a new place. We have a new reality that's within us. But in our minds, we cling to an old life. We cling to what was in this place. And it's like our minds go back there. And the more we let our minds go back there, the more we're drawn to that place that is not the place of freedom. It's not the place where um, Christ has set us free from. And so our mind is the battleground. This is the place where we need to, um, to uh, do battle, to, do, um, to get things right. I mean, just imagine I'm married. I don't imagine that I'm married. Imagine this scenario as I am married. <laughs> that... Um, I've got an old girlfriend, and I um, enjoyed her company. I like spending time with her. And if I said to Louis, Louis, I'm just going to go and hang out with my um, old girlfriend, and we're just going to have some, a few lunch dates, and, um, oh, we're not going to call it dates, a few lunch meetings. And you know, wh what's going on? I'm married to Louis, but there's an old thing that's going on that if I spend too much time in that old place, it's going to drag me down. It's going to take me to a place that is going to lead to awful things. In the same way as Christians, we can, you know, we have a new life. We have new freedoms. We don't need to sin anymore. We don't need to kind of get dragged down by those things. But actually, the reality is that we get drawn to these things. That's what temptation is all about. We get drawn to these things. And the more we dwell on those things, the more we let our minds go to that place, then it leads to other things that we will regret. Resurrection is the new life. We are free. It's like those chains, are, um, the padlock is broken and we're unbound. We're free to lead the life that God has intended us to lead. Verse 7. Anyone who's died 
has been set free from sin. We've been set free. How is that? How does that happen? Well, again, looking at this passage, Paul tells us. First of all, he says, verse 11, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. This is about our minds. It's about saying to ourselves, I am a new creation. I am no longer a person who inhabits this old self. I am a new creation. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5.17, I am a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. The old is gone, the new has come. It's, partly it starts with our minds where we say, that is the reality. I'm going to choose to live in that place. I'm going to choose to believe that that's true. Count yourself dead to sin and alive to God. Again, in, later on in Romans, Paul writes, be transformed by the renewing of your minds. It's Romans 12, verse 2. Be transformed by the renewing of your minds. This is something that we allow to happen to ourselves. The Spirit of God wants to transform us. And that happens when we say, Lord, I assent to what you want to do in me. I want to have my mind renewed and so be transformed. That's the first thing he says. Count yourself dead to sin and alive to God. That asks you to the mind. Second thing in verse 12. Do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. So the second thing is about an action to take. This is something where we just say, don't let it happen. Don't go to the place where, um, you know, don't ring that appointment. You know, ring up your old girlfriend and say, let's have lunch. Don't do it. Don't let the action lead to sin. And I think this is where meeting with other Christians is so important. Here at St. Paul's we have connect groups. They are our midweek groups. They're places where we begin to um, share life together um, as Christians. We begin to encourage each other. We learn from each other. We look at the scriptures together. We pray for each other. We eat together. And it's in those places that we begin to form relationships where we begin to trust each other enough to say, help. For me, I'm not just going to say help to anyone. I need to trust someone enough to say, okay, I, I, I will help you, and I trust them enough to help me, rather than you know, going around telling everyone that, you know, oh, have you heard about Rick? You know, he's... Blah, blah, blah. That's where we begin to form those deeper relationships of trust. And it's in that trusting relationship where we can begin to be accountable, where we can begin to say, do you know something? I'm really struggling in this area. I, I'm just finding myself going back and back to... Um, uh, the situation where I just feel sorry for myself all the time and it's just dragging me down and it's affecting the way I view life, it's affecting the way I, I behave and I want someone, to, I want you to help me. Can you pray for me? Can you encourage me? Can you put me in the right direction? And accountability means that I give you permission to ask me how it's going next week. I'm not just going to tell you this week but I need you to ask me next week, how's it going? How's it going? That's about trust. You can do that with, when you trust someone. Do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies. Interesting, this word mortal, is a, it's a, a physical word. It's like sin is birthed in doing something, um, doing something. It's an active thing. And once, it, once we do something with our bodies, it kind of begins to affect the whole of our lives. So just think about you know, what we do with our eyes. Where are we looking with our eyes? What are we... Um, choosing to watch? What are we choosing to, um, to read? What, are we choosing, what images are we choosing to look at? Do not let sin reign in the way you use your eyes. What about ears? The, way, the, the conversations we choose to listen to. What we agree with in conversations around us. And the, I remember in, in, uh, when I was uh, working in Unilever, just the, the kind of gossip that was going on in the office about various people was extraordinary. And um, do you know something that happens in churches as well? And it mustn't, but it does, and it shouldn't. We need to be those who don't do that kind of thing anymore. We choose to use our ears in a different way. Our hands, if we use them for service rather than for um, getting into trouble. Our feet, not letting our feet take us to places where it's going to be dangerous for us, where it's going to be difficult for us, where we're going to, we know we're going to... Um, end up in sin. Do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies. Count yourself dead to sin and alive to God. 
about our minds. Do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies. It's about an action. Then verse 13, the first part of it, over the page. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness. This is about specifics. Again, think about your eyes. What am I going to watch, Lord? About our ears, about our hands and our feet. Don't offer any part of yourself to sin. So in this, recognize the power of sin. Recognize the power, how it can just be very subtle but leads us into places we shouldn't be going to. Recognize that these things actually belong to the old life. This is old life territory. And you have died to that. In Christ, we've died to that. Something, a transaction has happened through the cross, and we now have a new life where those things don't need to happen anymore. Don't need the old life that drags us back. Don't cling to those things, Paul says. Stay in this new place. Live in this new place. Begin to inhabit the freedoms that are in this new place. You can do that through the power of God. The power of God is available. The power that raised Jesus from the dead, quite a lot of power, Paul says in Ephesians, is available to us. That same power that raised Christ from the dead is available to us, to help us. That's why um, at the end of our services, ministry times are so important, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It's in those times where we... um, open ourselves to God and say, God, I want you to move in my life. I want you to change things. I I say yes to the things that you want to do. So when we pray, um, um, I I always encourage people to put their hands out like this, just to say, Lord, I want to receive from you. This is body language. It's different to that. That's it. What does that say to you? Keep away. I don't want you to do anything to me. Um, We do that because we're vulnerable, because we're scared. We don't want, we're not sure what's going to happen. But if we know God, he has a loving, trusting God, we say, God, I want to receive from you. I want to have everything you have for me. I want you to work in my life. That's just, it's body language. I find it helpful for me. But basically what we're doing in that prayer time is saying, God, come and, do, come and work in me. And so when we have those times, I want to encourage you not to fear, um, but to respond to what God wants to do in you to come forwards um, if, you, if you feel actually you'd love someone to pray with you, to respond in any way that you think um, is going to change things. Um, there are two things that stop us. Pride. What will other people think if I come forwards? Will they think, oh, he's the terrible sinner that has responded to that particular word, <laughs> um, pride? Or is it apathy? Oh, my God. Not today. Those two things actually hold us back from all that God has for us. Don't let those things stop you. A new beginning, a new freedom that we have through the resurrection, and finally, a new purpose. Look at the second half of, well, the middle part of um, verse 13. 13, um, what I call B. But rather, he gives us a new purpose, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. Offer yourselves to God. This is our new inheritance. The reality is, Paul says, you're either a slave to sin or you're a slave to God. There is no other option. You're a slave to sin or you're a slave to God. And the reality is, we need to, in this new place, in this new freedom, with this new beginning, when we begin to serve God, we experience a new purpose that is just transforming, a purpose that is meaningful, that gives a purpose to every single person in the church, every single person in the church for the world. He's given us new life. He's given us new hope. He's given us new purpose. And the difference is that you can make a difference in this world by submitting to and serving God. You can change the world. I've seen this happen. I've seen it happen to me. When other people have served me, when someone invited me to come to church for the first time to to hear the gospel, and when I responded, when I was um, 19 years old, it transformed my life. I'm so grateful for Tim and Philippa who invited me. Philippa's life was transformed because Louis, my wife, did the same thing for her. She led her to Christ. 
People that we encounter, that we pray for, that we speak about, that we encourage, that we serve, that we love, that we bless, their lives will be transformed through you. Serve God with every part of your life. Be the best father that you can be. Be the best mother that you can be. Be the best friend that you can be. Be the best member of your community that you can be. Be the best lawyer, the best accountant, the best teacher, the best student. Whatever you spend your time and your life doing, be the best that you can be for God. Say, God, I want to do this for you. I want to use the gifts and the skills and the calling that you've given to me for you. I think for some, and we're going to start focusing on this a little bit outside these times, but um, there are some who God is calling to be in full time working in the church. Perhaps you're being called to be ordained. And there are a number of people who have just come up to me. I just want to let you know if that's you, we're going to be meeting um, as a group of people. There are quite a few who are feeling actually God is calling me to um, uh, maybe to get ordained in the church. And if that's you, let me know because I'll let you know a date when we're going to have a drink together and um, explore those things um, uh, together in, that, in, in, a, in, a, in another place. Serve him in every way. And the last part of verse 13, offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. Not an instrument of sin, an instrument of righteousness. This is the way to offer the whole of our bodies to God. Offer your time to God. Think about the way you use your time and say, God, I offer this to you. You be in charge of my time. Offer your skills to God. You know, um, the people I know here that are in congregation, you are so skilled. You have so much to offer, so much to give. Offer those skills to God. Offer your resources, your money, your passions, the things you love, the things that you're passionate about, offer them to God. Offer your future to God. Next week, we're going to be, as you saw from the SBS News, we're going to be talking about Pentecost, thinking about Pentecost, the birth of the church. That's when the church started in Acts chapter 2. But also where we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the one who gives gifts to the church so that everyone can be built up. So there's a a common good that comes. And when we give, when we receive those gifts, they're to be used. So part of next week is going to be about receiving afresh the Holy Spirit. But part of it as well is going to be about exploring how you can use your gifts in the church to bless the church, to encourage the church, to um, enable the church to flourish. Every part. Offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. A new beginning, a new freedom, and a new purpose. Um, Earlier this week, a few of us were at the HTB Leadership Conference in the Albert Hall. It was an amazing, amazing time. And if they, I think they're going to release some of the um, podcast things. I encourage you to go to the HTB website to listen to them. They're absolutely amazing. But there on the Monday, we heard about um, a man called Daryl. Um, Tunningly, and he was um, being interviewed on the stage and he said that um, he told a story at 11 he started to use drugs by 16 he was um, uh, sell, you know, he was addicted himself and he was selling large quantities of drugs to others and he became a debt collector um, he went basically asking people for the money that they owed and it was pretty vicious he um, there's one occasion where, a, you know, these grass trimmers um, he used on the bottom of someone's feet because they owed 300 pounds. So that was the way that he was um, uh, getting people to pay their debts. At 17, he took part in an armed robbery. He was involved in stealing car batteries from uh, expensive cars. And then he thought, well, I'll move on to the expensive cars themselves. And he got involved in one which involved um, uh, an armed robbery. And he was arrested and he was sentenced to... Um, to five and a half years in prison. When he went inside, he was very aggressive. He was an aggressive man. He would just punch 
someone and then ask questions um, if he didn't like them. And um, people stayed away from him. But there was, on one of these rounds, he was, uh, you know, the people were kind of coming around with the library trolley, and he was offered um, a book. And the person offering to him said, we'd like to come on an Alpha course. Alpha course is a, a, an opportunity to explore the Christian faith. And um, he, uh, he said, no, I don't want to have anything to do with it. And if you ask me again, I'm going to punch you. <laughs> so the guy kind of walk, walks on. The next day, he comes around again, gives him another book, and says, um, uh, by the way, about the Alpha course, I forgot to say, and the guy says, just begin to think, oh, you know, I thought I told you about the Alpha course. He's just kind of raising his fist. By the way, there's going to be free chocolate biscuits. <laughs> and he said, okay, I'll come. And um, he um, came on the course, and he said that it was run by two nuns who were retired. And the thing he said about the retired nuns is, how old do you have to be to be a retired nun? Anyway, um, <clears throat> they were kind of fulfilled all his expectations of what a Christian might look like. Um, I'll leave that to your imagination. But um, he, on that course, he experienced God. And he went back to his cell after one of the sessions. And he prayed a prayer. And he said this, God, if you're real, prove it. Take away my drug addiction. Take away all this anger that's inside me. And if you do that for me, I'll live the rest of my life for you. And he went to bed. The next morning, he woke up. And um, he went to reach for his cigarette, which he did every morning. And when he brought it to his mouth, he felt physically sick. And he remembered the night before, and he, he took all his cigarettes and threw them out of his cell window. He got up and went to where his drugs were. And he um, reached for his drugs, and he felt the same physical sickness. He didn't want to take them, so he threw them out of the window. He said, actually, they were very lucky, the, the round of um, prisoners who do the cleaning up in the mornings, because it was before then that the clean, clean up happened. So they would have got their supply. But he threw them out the window, and as soon as he did that, he stopped feeling sick. When he looked in the mirror to shave, he didn't recognize the person who was in front of him. That person was smiling back at him. In fact, he said it was beaming. It was a different person. And since that day, he hasn't touched drugs. He hasn't smoked, he hasn't drunk, he hasn't been in a fight. In the prison, he started helping running Alpha Course, and he told us that um, over 500 people had done it in that particular prison. He then got moved to another prison and started Alpha in that one. Prison officers started coming to him to speak to him and asking for advice and counselling. When he left prison, he was met at the prison gate um, by um, a man who was working for the ex uh, Caring for Ex-Offenders program that's um, also started out of HTB. And this person was a local magistrate um, called Mark Finch. And um, so he was met, this kind of criminal, quite hardened criminal, was met at the, uh, the, the prison gates, not by an, another one trying to drag him back into crime, but by a magistrate. He got to know that magistrate and eventually married his daughter, Rebecca. Amazing. Um, they've now got two children. And Daryl's asked what difference Jesus made in his life. And... Um, by this stage, he said, actually, I've become a Pentecostal pastor. I'm now helping to lead a church. You know, just a huge transformation in his life. And he said this, what difference has Jesus made? I don't say this lightly. I really do mean it. Jesus is more important to me than the air I'm breathing. He said this, now he's my everything. He's my lifeline. He's my strength. He's everything. I couldn't live without him. Everything I do is through him and for him. My life wouldn't be the same. It wouldn't be the way it is if he wasn't exactly who he said he was. The resurrection shows us that our lives can be transformed. That we can have a new beginning from the old self. We can have new freedoms from the old self. We can have a new purpose in our lives from our old selves. Let's stand and let's pray.